So there's a phenomenon in American culture where people are buying cars that are too big to fit in their own garages. There was a Vice article written about this. And it starts off in a rather poetic way. The self-own is what separates us from the animals. You may often think that we use our logical and moral capabilities to make better choices. But rather, just as human, we use them to justify making the wrong choices. Today, I'm going to talk to you about veganism. So there's a major problem with veganism, and I mean a major problem. But to understand what that issue is, we first need to dive into veganism and ask ourselves, why would someone go vegan? So let's start with a trivial statement. Ethical systems exist within human society. They serve the purpose of creating stronger societies by marginalizing actions that we wouldn't want imposed upon ourselves. The golden rule, everybody has it. This is a system whose primary driver is empathy. But empathy for who? Well, of course, as history goes, this is a very fluid circle that kind of ebbs and swells with time. There's two major players in moral system. There's moral agents and moral patients. Moral agents are humans of a higher intelligence like you or I who can make decisions that can be judged based upon our moral system. Moral patients are beings of a lower intelligence who may not be able to fully understand what the consequences of their actions would be. And so they will not be judged based on their decision. But these are people who are included within our empathetic system. So we can think of most people are moral agents. We do actions that are judged by our morality and moral patience. Our suffering is important and we take it into account, right? But we do have that wider circle of moral patients who are not moral agents. This includes people like children or the disabled. Typically, you know who they are in society because they have laws against abusing them but we don't necessarily hold them in the same penal system that we would for everyone else. They are allowed to make errors in their moral judgment because we don't expect their moral judgment to be perfectly developed. And then finally, we have other things like plants and objects. They have no indication that they would have any kind of possible ability to have intelligence. Now, consider a moral ambiguity, a cow. We can kill this cow for food and we may claim it's because this cow lacks knowledge of self. It has such a reduced intelligence, it falls outside the realm of moral patiency. However, many children also lack the concept of self, so is it okay to kill and eat children? Well, no. Children are firmly within moral patienthood. You're going to run into an issue, two of marginal cases. The idea is that whatever characteristic, intelligent or whatever, you think separates humans from animals, there will always be an animal. There will always be a human that lacks it or an animal that possesses it. You could say, well, it's our ability to feel empathy, but other animals feel empathy. Well, they form bonds with other humans. Well, <laughs> it's actually very fascinating. And it's the thing that convinced me to go vegan 10 or so years ago, kind of science behind animal cognition and the rich inner lives that animals lead. In an article written for Scientific American by a researcher who was very interested in whether or not animals mourn after they're dead, uh, he writes a story of two ducks named Cole and Harper, who are going to be used for foie gras, which if you don't know, is a system in which they put a pipe down the throats of these ducks and constantly feed them so that they get fatty liver disease kill them, then they take the liver, they grind it up, and they make a pate. So when Cole could no longer walk due to the pain that he was experiencing in his leg, he was euthanized. Harper was allowed to watch this, and after the euthanization, he laid his head and neck on Cole's head and neck for many hours. Days after his friend's death, he would kind of brush off all the other ducks, and he would go and sit by the pond that he and Cole used to go to, and then he died two months after. This is not something that's done to perform for humans. This is evidence of some kind of rich inner life these animals experience. And obviously ducks aren't the only one. Dogs have been known to mourn after their owner passes. 
<laughs> Believe it or not, cats actually know their name. They just don't respond to it. Link in the description of a review that someone wrote on uh, cow cognition, because I think it's very fascinating to understand the kind of inner workings of a cow's mind. I'm reminded of cloth monkey. This is a reference to some experiments they did in the 1950s to see if little monkeys go to their mother because they have milk and it's a utilitarian aspect, or if they go because they're warm and they feel safer. What they found is that the monkeys would go and feed, but they much preferred cloth monkey. Cloth monkey was the nice monkey. Didn't provide them any utilitarian value, but certainly nice. For calves that are allowed to spend all of their childhood with their mother, they were a lot more active and playful and curious and adventurous two and a half years later, something that permanently affected their personalities. <laughs> So in the edge cases of human cognition, there is a lot of overlap between the mental inner lives of animals and the mental inner lives of humans. So if they're aware of what's happening to them and can suffer, there's no reason not to include them as moral patients. These are animals that we can cause harm to, and we should be mindful about how our actions cause them harm. Now, don't get me wrong, you obviously don't have to weigh the suffering of a cow equal to that of a human, and I don't think anyone would expect you to or anything like that. But because killing animals early in their lives for food innately leads to their suffering, we should try to limit it as much as we can. And so this idea that animals can feel suffering and so it's bad to make them suffer is where we get the definition of veganism as told by vegans. Veganism is a philosophy and a way of living that seeks to exclude as far as possible and practical all forms of exploitation and cruelty to animals for food, clothing, or any other purpose, and by extension, promote the development and use of animal-free alternatives for the benefit of animals, humans, and the environment. Here's the thing. Remember that problem I was telling you about earlier that veganism has? Well, now we can finally get into it. If veganism has, you know, a fine moral argument behind it, why is it not very convincing? Is everyone just morally abhorrent, in which case there's no point in appealing to morality at all? I mean, conservatives and socialism. Conservatives, they only view their life as kind of us versus them, right? They're stuck in that kind of mentality. Uh, so their worldview isn't really logically consistent anyway, but leftists, people who care about empathy and suffering, you bring it up and they say, oh, there's a bigger fish to fry. And you can say, well, this is something that you do three times a day. You actually have like a pretty strong force to support vegan businesses or support vegan options on menus by ordering it. They don't really care. We introduce people to a system that's unsavory and we ask them to opt out of it. Then why don't they? So this idea of people not necessarily engaging with the system that may be corrupt reminds me of a book that was written by Kurt Vonnegut called Mother Night. Kurt Vonnegut, if you don't know, highly influenced by the fact that he saw the bombing of Dresden during World War II. And he wrote a bunch of books, probably the most famous being Slaughterhouse-Five, which revolves around the scene of someone experiencing the bombing of Dresden. This is Schlachthof 5. 5 is English 5. Schlacht is slaughter. Hof is house. So Mother Night is another great book by Kurt Vonnegut. And in it, it describes the fictionalized account of Howard W. Campbell Jr., who is a spy during World War II, acting both in the interest of the U.S. Army, but also in the interests of the Nazi propagandists. It's going to change as surely as world supremacy is the birthright of the Aryan race. This has been Howard W. Campbell Jr. Hi, Hitler. And in this way, he's not really passionate, though, about politics. He doesn't really care about the war or the outcome of the war 
at all. He's simply just working for these two agencies. And this book starts off with Campbell sitting in an Israeli prison for his war crimes. And so in this way, Kurt Vonnegut is dealing with a very interesting moral problem. It's when it comes to suffering on a great scale, does it matter what our intentions are? Should we be consequentialist about this in our pursuit of justice? We know this because Kurt Vonnegut opens the book in a very specific way. Uh, he says, this is the only story of mine whose moral I know. I don't think it's a marvelous moral, I simply happen to know what it is. We are what we pretend to be, so we must be careful about what we pretend to be. This is a reference to Campbell, who is obviously pretending to be a Nazi for the American war effort, but at the same time is distributing Nazi propaganda through the radio. So he is doing demonstrable harm, even if it also has encoded signals within it. Even if you were a spy, you could never have served the enemy as well as you served us. All the ideals that make me proud of being a Nazi, they came not from Hitler, but from you. We know that in his heart of hearts, he doesn't really care about the Nazi war effort or the American war effort. All he really cares about is his wife and being a playwright. But does that matter? Does it matter what people's intentions are if our actions are so severe? You can tell that I'm a child of the internet because it hasn't been 10 minutes and I'm already talking about the Nazis. As Hannah Ardent points out, evil is banal. Evil is simply people acting within an evil system. We start to deal with a very interesting aspect of human psychology in that it's hard to place blame on people who are simply working within an evil system. There's a very famous documentary that's around six hours long called Show Up. Uh, you can watch it for free on YouTube and it is um, a director going around Poland, other places with concentration camps and interviewing people there. He has a very famous interview with someone who drove one of the trains, transported the Jewish people to these concentration camps. The man talks about simply doing his job and he gets combative. He gets upset when you point out that what he was doing was wrong. You get it? Do you get it? <laughs> it's a reference to the Smiths. So from this, we learn that individual actions are hard to explain, but a lot of times people do not have so much malice in their hearts, but rather cruelty works by implementing cruel systems. But the weird part is, is that humans tend to justify these cruel systems. What kind of facet of human psychology causes this abject rejection of morality? Are you smoking? Yeah, I, I'm smoking. Don't you know that smoking causes lung cancer? This has like been established forever. Hey, hey, can you fuck off? Tobacco lobby. Got a bunch of kids addicted to nicotine with jewels. Jesus Christ, even in my own house. Why are you participating in that system? That is a bad system and you should not participate in it. Yeah, 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 I get it. You think it's bad. God, you non-smokers are just so annoying. Have you ever heard of uh, cognitive dissonance? Cognitive dissonance. Well, if I had to guess, cognitive thought, dissonant, bad, bad thought. Yeah, well, that's actually some psychology that comes to us from the 50s or 60s from a guy named Fessinger. He had very interesting research. What he did is he followed around a bunch of cults that were predicting the end of the world on a certain day. And then he wanted to know what happens after that day comes and passes. I'm intrigued, tell me more. What he found was that the people who had invested the most in believing this typically didn't accept the reality. They became more sure of themselves. Now, I feel like if I were them, I would have accepted it. In fact, anyone who's made an investment into this does not want to believe that their investment was bad and okay. so there's a conflict between what you believe 
and the material reality, they just change what they believe instead of changing their actions. So you're telling me people can't deal with reality? This prompted a bunch of other studies from Festinger. In this way, Festinger started coming upon this psychology that I think is very interesting. When you point out to someone that their actions aren't in line with their morals, they're much more likely to modify their morality to fit their actions. One of the examples that Festinger uses is the example of smokers. Oh, did he now? And he talks about how smokers often have a lot of these arguments for why smoking is fine, and none of them really make a lot of sense. Ah, that's all overblown. It keeps me skinny. If you smoke two of them at the same time, the body thinks it's just one. But they're not there to make sense. They're there to reassure the smoker that what they're doing is okay. I, I don't get it. it. It is true, it makes you skinny. Bad decisions get justified, not changed. And now we start building upon this. People are not acting maliciously when they deny veganism. Rather, they are justifying their own choices to eat meat to themselves. But some people do change. Some people are open-minded. What happens there? I think you can start to see the whole web starting to unravel. So you might have thought when we started that people's logic led to their morals, led to their actions, and if they saw it caused cruelty, it would lead to change. But it doesn't really look like that. Instead, we use our logic to protect ourselves against cognitive dissonance caused by the morals. And we'll try to actually protect our actions using logic, not our morals, so our morals are the ones that end up changing. So what causes our actions? One theory is brought about by Jonathan Haidt. Our actions are more likely caused by our feelings of disgust or our intuition. Well, where do we get our intuition? This is called moral pillar theory, right? Their intuition, and their intuition is based on, uh, for liberals, it's mostly based on harm reduction and fairness. And then for conservatives, you also have loyalty, authority, and liberty playing a small role as well. So to bring this into something contemporary with conservatives, trans people, change, whatever, it triggers their disgust, which causes them to have insane actions. And so they're using their logic to actually justify. And so this helps me understand why a lot of conservatives, uh, when it comes to trans kids or gay kids, they have to imagine a cruelty is taking place and act like it's going through their moral compass to justify their actions, when in reality, it's mostly coming from a feeling of disgust. Their moral intuition, their gut reaction that they don't like this. And so they're not logically thinking about their cruelty at all. So how do we change? How do we change our actions? How do we get change in here? Well, this side is entirely protected by using our logic to uh, absolve us of cognitive dissonance. So if we want change, but well, we can change people's intuitions. It's a lot of, a lot of moral thinking is just your intuition backed up by post hoc logic. I want to have a disclaimer here. This is not true when people are very open-minded about things, when they say, oh, actually tell me more. Here, I think you can understand it's kind of major issue in veganism. The problem with veganism is it's highly based on cruelty. And so this cruelty needs to inform our morals and this moral needs to change our actions. However, when we go through this route, the more we are adamant about our morality, the more our logic is just going to be there to absolve the cognitive dissonance. Despite being a very moral proposition, the way that we need to talk about veganism is not through morality and not through animal suffering, but through normalization. <sighs> veganism seems to be in a very precarious situation. It is fundamentally a moral argument about harm reduction and cruelty. However, when we point this out to people, they're just gonna get defensive about it. And even worse so, the more strongly we argue our morals, the more strongly people will be embedded in their own beliefs, 
that doesn't ultimately serve them very well. So avoid sissy proteins like soy and stuff like that. And men need to eat lots of fat because it increases testosterone and energy. Just stay away from seed oils. So being vegan certainly isn't the cultural norm. What do we do about this? Like the cultural norm suggests that vegans are seen as annoying. So what do we need to do? Do we, want, do we need to run PR? Uh, no, actually, I, I don't think so. So I wanna take a moment to talk about, in my 10 years of being vegan, the only person I've ever turned vegan. So I started dating my boyfriend about eight years ago and I have been vegan since the moment we started dating and he has not been. And what I told him to make him go vegan was, no, stop, you don't have to go vegan. I don't care if you're vegan. I really don't care if you're vegan or not. As our relationship progressed and he moved in with me, I ended up cooking a lot of the dinners. Dinner was always vegan. And so it became easy for him to always be vegan simply by eating what I cooked. He's familiar with vegan talking points because we've been together for so long. When we go out to eat at a place that's not necessarily vegan but has options, he'll often opt for the vegan option. I think the problem with veganism isn't so much that people don't understand veganism or they don't believe animal cruelty is bad. In fact, I think it has nothing to do with that at all. I think people fundamentally don't feel empowered to make the decision to be vegan. They don't know what vegan food or nutrition looks like. And so it is our responsibility as people who are vegan not to convert, but to normalize and to allow people and to use our purchasing power to give people the option. It was contrary to how we started. I think people would care about this. I just think people are not empowered to do so. And another aspect is this study that I read called We Can't Keep Meeting Like This, which was a study of a thousand people in the UK that analyzed their views towards veganism. Most notably, over 50% of the people found veganism to be ethical and healthy, good for the environment. But very few people found veganism to be easy and convenient. So based on this, if we want people to go vegan, we need to stop trying to convince people that it's healthy or moral, because this is something people are already in agreement about. What they're not in agreement about is that it's something trivial or easy to do. I'm kind of burying the lead here, right? This is an issue within veganism, but I also feel like this is an issue within a lot of progressive politics that want to tackle cruel systems. We approach people with it as a moral or ethical conundrum and we use logic, they will fundamentally reject it. What we need to do is to show this option exists and to have people examine it, right? And fundamentally, it doesn't even make sense to critique people for operating within the system. What we need to do is to critique the system by showing alternatives and showing that these alternatives are better than what we currently can do. And if you're not doing that, you're not going to win anybody over. So this is video like five or something that I've made. Uh, if you like my channel, please subscribe, like, leave a comment, all that stuff. I'm not expecting to get more than like 100 views on this. so. All's well that ends well. Maybe if I do a call to action, I'll have more than five subscribers. I don't know. If you're a company that I've applied to and you're doing a background check and currently watching this video, feel free to subscribe, man. Like, welcome. <laughs> welcome. I make some banger content. As someone who's watched a lot of his own content, that's good. God damn it.